Have you ever seen this slick vintage car while cruising down the street? No? Well, that makes sense since they never really made it onto the road. But you never would have guessed that based on the ads that ran for the car at the height of the 1970s fuel crisis. The Dale was supposedly a maximum efficiency car that sported three wheels and promised 70 miles per gallon. It was the brainchild of Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael. To investors, Carmichael claimed she was the widow of a NASA engineer and a mother of five. In reality, she was a wanted fugitive who had ties to a counterfeiting operation. Hi, I'm Justin Dodd, filling in for Aaron this week on The List Show. Carmichael did make a few prototypes of the car, and one was even featured on The Price is Right. Hundreds of orders poured in, and all was looking pretty great. Then came an ill-fated test drive intended to raise money from Japanese backers. With no funding to actually produce the car, Carmichael eventually went into hiding with the investor's money. The story of her disappearance was featured on an episode of one of our favorite shows, Unsolved Mysteries, and she was arrested shortly after. <laughs> I've said it once and I'll say it again. You can fool the general public, but you can't outrun Robert Stack. The Dale is just one example of a historical scam, con, grift, lure, or trick that I'm gonna share with you today. Let's get started. I don't know who you have to bamboozle in order to get an entire category of scams named after you, but I suppose Charles Ponzi would be able to tell me. Ponzi emigrated from Italy to the US in the early 1900s. He reportedly gambled away his life savings on the boat ride over. After a few illicit attempts at making money, more than one leading to brief imprisonment, he finally came up with the scheme that his name would eventually become associated with. In 1920, Ponzi discovered that international postal reply coupons, which are essentially a form of prepaid postage, could be purchased and exchanged for five cents worth of US postage stamps. If the coupons were bought in a country with a weak economy where they cost less money, then exchanged for a regular stamp in a country with a stronger economy, and then sold, one could eventually make free money, more or less. Ponzi began recruiting people back in Italy to help with his scheme. His operation might never have landed him in hot water if he hadn't been so, well, let's say, ambitious. The trouble came when he began convincing investors to lend money to his securities exchange company, which he would then pay back plus 50% interest in 90 days. It sounded too good to be true, but that's because it was. Most of the money was not going to buy foreign postal coupons anymore. It was going into Ponzi's pocket and the rest was going to pay back other investors. The sham couldn't stay afloat forever. The New York Postmaster said that for Ponzi to have made as much money as he claimed, he'd need to have moved about 160 million postal vouchers across borders. But at the same time, the Wall Street Journal learned that the previous year, less than 1.2 million had been issued worldwide with a value of less than $60,000. Whoops. Ponzi had stolen $20 million from his investors and he was charged with mail fraud. Nowadays, any scam that functions by paying back old investors with new investors' money is called a Ponzi scheme. Charles Ponzi didn't invent the Ponzi scheme, though. He just perfected it. A man named William 520% Miller stole at least $100,000 from his investors while working as a bookie in Brooklyn back in 1899 using similar methods. This type of scam was also alluded to by Charles Dickens back in the mid-1800s. Apparently, at one point in time, the practice was known as the Rob Peter to pay Paul scheme. Pretty good name, but Ponzi scheme is just catchier. Another old timey scam is the practice of salting a mine. Salting in this case refers to adding valuable materials to a sample or mine in order to dupe potential buyers. This has been a fairly common practice during various gold rushes throughout history when a single profitable gold mine could guarantee you a life of comfort. If you could convince a buyer that your mine was the El Dorado of holes in the ground by sprinkling gold dust throughout it, you could make enough money to leave town and start a new life before your marks were any of the wiser. Some schemers would go as far as to load a shotgun with ore shavings and blast it into the rock surface so as to create a convincingly embedded wall of gold. And this practice isn't ancient history. A huge scandal in the 1990s centering on Brie X Minerals later inspired the Matthew McConaughey movie Gold. It was essentially a multi-billion dollar salting operation with mystery, lies, and specious reports of gold deposits in Indonesia. Throw some sunglasses on and give me an all right, all right, all right, and the movie basically writes itself. 
Selling something with an artificially inflated value is one thing, but selling something that doesn't even belong to you is another beast entirely. Take Peaches O'Day, the fictional character played by Mae West in the film Every Day's a Holiday, who sells the Brooklyn Bridge to a gullible buyer. <laughs> what a hilarious concept for a silly and totally not true film. Well, it turns out someone really did sell the Brooklyn Bridge. Actually, scratch that. Several people sold the bridge. Like, many times over. One con man by the name of George C. Parker forged convincing documents proving his ownership of the bridge. He would then sell it to Marks who were convinced they could make a fortune charging tolls on their newly purchased bridge. Parker also reportedly sold the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Statue of Liberty at various points. Two other bridge scammers were Charles and Fred Gondorf, who would literally erect signs that read, Bridge for Sale, during the hours they knew police officers were not around. The most perplexing part of these stories is not that someone would have the gall to sell a city bridge, but in the words of Luke Sant, author of Low Life, Lures, and Snares of Old New York, that there would have been suckers both gullible enough and sufficiently well-heeled to fall for it. The Gondorf brothers had many other cons up their sleeves, including a horse racing scam which would eventually help inspire the film The Sting, starring Robert Redford and Paul Newman. Though not an intentional con per se, it is worth noting that the makers of the film were sued for plagiarism by author David W. Maurer, who claimed the movie was suspiciously similar to his book The Big Con, a nonfiction account of early 20th century con men. The studio eventually settled out of court. While the phrase mail fraud doesn't sound like a wild, high-intensity criminal activity, these cons have the potential to be the most profitable and wide-ranging. Take the case of the Baker estate. Over the course of several decades, countless individuals with the surname Baker were contacted by representatives of the estate of Jacob Baker of Philadelphia, a tremendously wealthy man who died while his estate was unprobated. These other bakers were convinced that they had claimed to part of this fortune, and if they just paid the representatives a fair sum of cash, they could stake those claims. These people never received their money because Jacob Baker never existed. His entire estate was fabricated, and over the course of nearly 70 years, the con raked in millions from people who happened to be named Baker. In 1936, 28 people were indicted for what was probably the most wide-ranging case of mail fraud at the time. Then there's Oscar Hartzell, who used similar tactics to separate people from their money in hopes of reaping some part of an unclaimed fortune. His tale's protagonist, though, was not fictional. It was Sir Francis Drake, the famed adventurer. Hartzell convinced thousands of Drakes that they could claim some of Drake's fortune, which, according to Hartzell, had now with interest grown to $100 billion. All Hartzell had to do was sue the British government, an expensive endeavor, obviously, hence the need for investments from his drakes. His scam went on for years, and he was eventually arrested in 1933. Somehow, this did not deter his victims. Some of the people he had swindled even sent him more money for his trial. Reportedly, even after his death in 1943, many believed in Hartzell and their claim to the drake fortune. What's a good con without a good costume? An 1888 newspaper reported about a con artist who introduced himself as Father McCarthy and established himself in the local church. His con involved going looking for a gift for a cardinal, picking out some choice diamonds and jewelry, and then having them brought over to the priest's quarters. When the jeweler arrived, McCarthy would open the door dressed as a priest, of course, and bring the gems into another room to show other men of the cloth. McCarthy was, in reality, sneaking out a back entrance, never to be seen in town again. And lastly, if you're looking for some old-timey conning advice, you should turn to Victor Lustig. Lustig was one of the most notorious confidence men of the 20th century. He's known today as the man who sold the Eiffel Tower twice because, well, I think you can guess why. He also created one of the most successful counterfeit money operations in history. Before he died behind bars, he's said to have written down his 10 commandments for aspiring con men. Some highlights include never look bored, wait for the other person to reveal religious or political views and then have the same ones, never boast, but let your importance be quietly obvious, and lastly, never get drunk. Lustig sounds like the perfect George Clooney in his historical prequel to Ocean's Eleven. What historical con woman would you cast alongside him? Thanks for watching Mental Floss on YouTube. Let us know your favorite modern day scam in the comments below. Hopefully one that you didn't fall for too recently. I mean, there's only so many foreign princes out there, you know. I'll see you next time.